So are we admitting all, right? I'm going to just admit all. Be one second, just do one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Armin, just a quick question: Like, how how um how is like how diverse is our audience? Like, are they more CS or? Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure the entire audience, but um, oh. somewhat diverse, I guess, broadly okay. in science. Um, just one. I should hide the equations or not? No, 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 no. Well, I'm giving a theory. I'm giving an ML theory talk. So uh, ah, okay, okay. So they will see a lot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this will be. This will probably be the most mathematical. But I try to keep everything intuitive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then also it's pictures. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Starting with the worst. All right. Maybe maybe we get going. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third uh, online webinar uh, that we have as part of a. IMS New Researcher Group Initiative, uh, where we have a joint webinar with the Young Stats Group um, and the organizers of the Young Data Science Research Seminar at ETH Zurich. These uh, webinars are meant to showcase um, the works of, in this case, three young researchers on a particular topic um, with a discussant. Uh, so today we are Lucky to have um, three speakers. Uh, the topic is extrapolation for extrapolation to unseen domains from theory to applications. Uh, the three talks will, um, in order, be from Max uh, Simchowitz, um, and I'll introduce each of them when their talk comes. Uh, Mo Lutfalahi and Jijing Jin. And we'll have a discussion by Nikolai Meinshausen at the end. Um, so the first talk will be by Max. Uh, a little bit about Max as a way of introduction. He is a postdoctoral researcher in the robot uh, locomotion group at MIT CSAIL. Uh, he studies the theoretical foundations of machine learning problems with sequential or dynamical component. He focuses right now on out of distribution learning and robotics and past work ranging from controls, reinforcement learning, optimization, and algorithmic fairness. He received his PhD at Berkeley, uh, working with Ben Recht and Mike Jordan, and has received a bunch of awards. Um, so um, the floor is his. Before I just uh, we go, uh, just a few notes about asking questions. Um, um, for Max, we would like the questions to be, um, he'll answer the questions at the end. So you're welcome to put it on the chat um, or ask at the end. So he'll have about 20 some minutes um, to uh, to have his talk and we'll take the questions afterwards. Thank you. And the floor is yours. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction. And also if anybody wants to email me a question after the talk, um, you can find me online and just send me an email. And that's great too. 
Uh, I stretched the definition of unseen domains a little bit. So we're gonna we're gonna work with just more standard notions of distribution shift for today's talk, but I'll go into I'll go into more detail. So um, I'm gonna present some work with uh, some collaborators today at um, MIT and Microsoft Research uh, about heterogeneous distribution shift. So let me kind of just dive into it. So the, the classical picture of machine learning and stats that we're taught is that we have some vat of data uh, that consists of all the data in the world. And then we get to sample uniformly from that data and we get our you know training data. And then we use some machine learning algorithm to provide us all, ourselves some kind of predictor, be it a classifier, a regressor, lang language model, which tries to make some prediction about the world using this training data. And we ultimately hope that, that the predictor kind of generalizes or reflects what would have happened if we used all the data in the world, uh, comparing to sort of this best possible classifier that used all available data. But of course, we know that this isn't really how things work. So in reality, the thing that we end up deploying our model on looks quite different. And even if we subsample from this, we're going to need to reason about how our predictor trained on training data sort of extrapolates or generalizes out of distribution to data sampled from our testing cases, right? So this is kind of the, the more uh, common paradigm that ends up happening. So what kind of predictors do we use? Well, uh, a very popular thing that we might do is called empirical risk minimization. So all this does is just try to find a predictor that exhibits the smallest amount of loss on all the examples in the training data. So you can think of this as your neural network. You train it by gradient descent, trying to minimize, say, prediction accuracy on all the examples on average. And this is just one example of that. And now you could think that, you know, because this is only trained on its training data, uh, it's a pretty naive thing to do if you anticipate distribution shift. But uh, somewhat surprisingly, uh, many algorithms that are intentionally designed to uh, combat distribution shift or to exhibit a distribution shift have been shown not to really improve very much over empirical risk minimization in a very reliable way. Uh, and in fact, this is from this very, uh, this very influential uh, aggregation of data sets called the WILDS data sets that looked at sort of distribution shifts in real world scenarios. And they found that, that all these sort of intentionally robust algorithms seem to do worse than just vanilla empirical risk minimization, even though ERM is designed just for in-distribution generalization. So I think I'm going to try to understand why this might be by looking at a very specific class of problems. So in this talk, we're not going to be able to provide a comprehensive account of out-of-distribution learning that's way above my pay grade. Uh, I'm only going to look at one kind of out-of-distribution phenomena that I'll explain, and I'll use that to try to provide some evidence as to why ERM might be so hard to beat as a, as a mathematical baseline. And again, this is based on a paper, Statistical Learning Under Heterogeneous Distribution Shift. There's a typo in the ICML title, and the correct spelling is an archive, but both will come up on Google. Um, so heterogeneous distribution shift. So imagine that I have data. Let's, let's say I'm trying to, um, I have blood tests, for example, one diagnostic, and I might have some medical imaging. And my goal is to predict an outcome, a progression of a disease. Now, when I actually train my classifier I'm going to, or my predictor, I'm going to deploy it on new data from a different hospital, which will have some different distribution of progression, blood tests, and medical imaging. And what I'm going to try to understand in heterogeneous distribution shift is how changes in the two features, here the blood test and the medical imaging, might affect performance on the a new distribution downstream at the new hospital. So there's been a lot of work on understanding these kinds of effects. So much of the past work focused on causal effects, right? So we might imagine that age, diet, and family history, all these underlying causal factors might affect your blood work or your imaging. And these are kind of latents that affect sort of what the disease progression looks like. But in this talk, I'm not going to focus on causal factors. I think there's been a lot of amazing research in that direction already. Instead, I'm going to present an idea that statistical factors can also be really important in understanding distribution shift. And I'll explain what this means. So let's start off with a simple experiment. We're going to consider having two features, uh, call them X and Y, and we're going to try to predict an outcome Z. So what we'll do is we'll train on data from a training distribution and test on some new data from a testing distribution. And we're going to evaluate the performance as we vary X versus as we vary Y. So as there's a different amount or heterogeneous amount of shift in X and in Y. We're going to make a very, very strong assumption for this talk, which is not all, does not always hold in practice, but will be useful for isolating the phenomena that we're interested in, where we'll assume that we're in a pure covariate shift setting. So this means that the distribution shift is only affecting X and Y, but that the conditional distribution of the outcome given X and Y remains identical under the training and the testing distribution called covariate shift. So what we're going to try to understand here is if there is a simple heuristic by which we can guess whether the shift in X versus the shift in Y degrades performance of a classifier more severely. So I'm going to present the following. Uh, we're going to, for what we're going to do is we're going to simply define, de define an auxiliary task uh, for each indi individual set variable separately. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to measure an in-distribution generalization error on that task alone. So no distribution shift yet, right? We're not, we don't have access to test data already. And finally, we're going to just call the, the, the feature that has better in-distribution generalization the simpler feature, because we expect that sort of it's easier to generalize to simpler examples. But this is just nomenclature. And in fact, the fundamental quality is in-distribution generalization. So we can, we can evaluate this on um, a range of data sets, be they synthetic regression, kind of classic benchmarks for, uh, for imitating distribution shifts, evaluating distribution shift, or even toy examples from uh, behavior cloning, robotic behavior cloning. And we find the following phenomena that ERM exhibits less, uh, uh, less sensitivity to distribution shift in the simpler feature, i.e. the simpler feature which generalizes better in distribution. That is, in distribution generalization project projects out of distribution sensitivity. Uh, so a natural heuristic that we get from this is that if we want to gauge the sensitivity to a variable out of, out of distribution, what we can do is we can design auxiliary tasks and use these auxiliary tasks as a way to predict via its in-distribution generalization error, how much out of distribution sensitivity we might anticipate. So I'm going to make a hypothesis as to why this is happening, which is that empirical risk minimization, even though you're training a predictor on two features together, somehow adapts to the feature space and is learning the simpler feature at a faster rate than the more complicated one, even for tasks where both are being thrown into the same machine learning model. Okay, so that's the hypothesis we're going to evaluate. So let me give a simple mathematical model where we can study this in a restricted but still rather general setting. So I'm going to consider the, pro the, the, the formulation of making a scalar prediction from the sum of two functions that depend on different features. And to make it interesting statistically, it's going to be corrupted by noise. So the reason I'm going to study this is because it's potentially the simplest model by which I can study different shifts in x and y. But it's also rather general because I can, I'm going to allow the dependence on the variable x and on the variable y to be made through general fun classes of predictors. So we'll assume that f star lies in a class of hypotheses big F and g star in hypotheses big G. So this, these classes can be totally general. Um, so for now, we're going to just relabel it. So X will be the simpler feature, just without loss of generality, and Y will be the more complex one. And I'll define those as we go along. And again, heterogeneous distribution shift is just the setting where X is going to change more. The distribution of X will change more than that of Y. So what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the following protocol. We're going to start with empirical risk minimization, right? So this is just minimizing your squared error on the training data with training data drawn from some training distribution. And then we're going to look at the following notion of called excess risk, but we're going to look at it under test data. So we're going to draw X, Y, Z triples from test data, again, only pure covariate shift. And here we're going to look at excess risk, which is just how well did our learned predictor from step, step one predict the, uh, the variable Z relative to the best we could have done, which is just using F star plus G star. Okay, so that's going to be the formulation. We're going to study how well ERM does under this uh, covariate shift. So why is this an interesting problem? Well, what we're going to argue is that we recover f faster than g when x is simpler than y. Okay. Now, that might seem, and oh, as a consequence of this, it'll imply that we have more resilience to distribution shifts in x than in y. Now, this might seem clear, but there are a lot of challenges to doing so. The first is that this model is non-identifiable. If I add a constant factor to f and subtract a constant for g, for g from g, for example, then I get the same predictor. And there's, in fact, a broader class of non-identifiability that we're going to have to reckon with. But I think the more e interesting phenomena here is that we need to prevent G from overfitting F, right? So imagine that G was every function in the world. Then G could fit any, any Z, even with noise, and in particular could drown out all the signal that we use to learn F. So we're going to have to reason about why this can't ha happen, or at least the extent to which it happens is lower order than we would expect. And that's going to be kind of the big mathematical challenge we're going to undertake here. So the main result I'm going to, is, is the following, and I'm going to spend the next few slides unpacking what all the terms mean. Here, new xy is a constant which measures how much distribution shift you're experiencing in the joint distribution of both x and y together. And new y similarly is an upper bound on the shift in the marginal distribution of y alone without respect to the shift in x. More formally, these are upper bounds in what are called radon nicotine derivatives, or if you prefer, if everything is continuously distributed, density ratios between x and y. So this is a uniform upper bound on the density change in density ratios, and this is the change in density ratios only involving y. And one can weaken this in various ways to other things like chi-squared distributions, if you prefer. Um, I, I should remark something that here, this is the joint shift in x and y, but under the special case where x and y are independent under the training distribution, then in fact, you can just replace this term in our bound with only the shift in x alone, the marginal of x, which is a much sharper in certain cases. Okay, 
So these are what these, these distribution shift constants look like. What are the terms in red and blue? Informally, I'm going to use error of f to refer to the training distribution generalization error of regression on for f x alone and for g y alone. Right. So this is corresponds simply to the experiment that we did at the beginning, where what we do is we imagine training f on an auxiliary task just to try to predict f star plus noise with just x alone. And we look at its generalization error only on training data, right? So with no distribution shift. And error NFF measures is a measure of the kind of training distribution generalization error we should expect. Now, more formally for people that are um, experts in statistical learning theory, this refers to the squared critical radius of the localized Dudley integral of the class F, which measures what's called a metric entropy or complexity of the class F. But for everybody else, just think of it as a proxy for indistribution chaining error. And it's a term that we expect to go to zero as we collect more examples n, but also as f becomes more complicated, more complex, it'll become larger. So that's that's the notion of f. So what is our bound saying? Oh, last thing is, so then we're going to take his definition, x is simpler than y, than y, if error n of f is less than error n of g, right? So this is just saying that sort of indistribution generalization error using x is less than the indistribution generalization error using y. That's our notion of simplicity. Again, better on auxiliary tasks with f, worse generalization, and corresponds to simpler hypotheses, more complicated hypotheses. And again, we're going to be in the regime where everything is consistent. So as we collect more data, sort of both of these errors are going to zero, but at different rates, the error in g might go to zero much slower. OK, cool. So that's what all the terms mean. So why is the bound interesting? Well, if you look at what happens in the term that hits the distribution shift involving x, nu x, y, we have a quadratic dependence on this error n of g. And in particular, in the realm of statistical consistency, where these errors are going to zero with more data, the square of a small number is way smaller than the small number. So we're getting something much better here. We're getting a quadratic speed up in our dependence on the error of g. Let's compare to a naive bound that might make this clear. So if you weren't to do anything special, you would find that the testing generalization error, without any kind of sophisticated analysis, would scale with the joint distribution shift in x and y times the, the, the sum of the error in f plus the error in g. So this term is quadratically better for the term that hits here. It's much smaller. We're getting a much uh, much more benign uh, dependence on how uh, on uh, the terms in G. So let me kind of continue explaining this uh, here because uh, this is go this is squared and therefore much smaller. This term can go to zero much more quickly than error in G alone. Error f plus error G squared is typically much much less than error of G. And as a consequence, we can tolerate this number nu x y to be much larger than we could tolerate if this was just linear in G. In particular, what this means is that we can be much more resilient to shifts involving X than we can be to shifts just with big shifts with Y alone. We can make this term be a lot larger, which explains why we might be able to have greater resilience to shifts in the statistically simpler variables X. So let me kind of explain. Oh, and the big, that's, so that's the big takeaway is that ERM ends up being more resilient to heterogeneous shifts in the simpler features. So let me kind of explain kind of how we think about this and explain what's going on under, under the hood. Remember that we have this problem of identifiability. So it turns out that we can characterize all identifiable uh, uh, transformations, specifically training when you go to the error goes to zero, uh, only recovers up to a term called, I'm going to call the bias term, where we can perturb this ground truth by some term, which is basically a conditional expectation of the difference between F and F star given Y. That's a bit complicated, so I'm going to give you the simplest case, which is that if x and y are independent of one another, then this bias term is a constant because x and y are independent, so conditioning just takes a pure expectation, and therefore these bias terms just become constants, and we recover identifiability up to transformations. But in fact, there's this bigger class of unidentifiable things we have to deal with. So the kind of key starting point for this is a pretty simple lemma to establish, which gives a decomposition of the excess test error, and it decomposes it into two terms. The first term is how much we're recovering up at F star, but up to this bias term that we can't identify. And the second one is just simply how much the sum is recovering these two. Now, the second term can actually can be pretty easily bounded by standard statistical learning methodology. And what we see pretty readily is, in fact, that when, you know, G is the more complicated class, then this just get control. This is just controlled by the error in G. So you can think of this bound over here as corresponding to this remainder term, which hits the distribution shift in Y. And all the interesting, all the magic is happening in this term, this recovery of F by itself. So the key theorem, the key kind of technical difficulty is showing that, in fact, this recovery of F up to the bias scales as follows, in particular, having a lower order dependence in G. 
So what is this saying? This is saying that ERM is adapting to the simpler function class F, and it has a lower order dependence on the capacity of G to overfit things that F needs to learn. Because naively, you would pay linear in G, but in fact, we show that in fact, the overfitting of G is, is smaller, it's this quadratic object. So how good is this quadratic dependence in G? Well, there's a family of methods that are designed explicitly to learn one fun one variable in the presence of another one being a nuisance. They're called double machine learning techniques, where let's say you don't care at all about the dependence on Y and you just want to learn the dependence on X. And it turns out that this square dependence on the error of G is exactly what you find in double machine learning methods. In, in other words, it's expl exactly what you find in algorithms that are explicitly designed to, to throw away the G variable. So essentially, we're showing that ERM is doing as well as methods that expl explicitly are designed to throw away the G, but automatically without having to do anything fancy. It just gets it for free. And as a consequence, this might suggest why empirical risk minimization as a, bench as a baseline is so hard to beat, is because it's adapting intrinsically without any additional modification to the easier parts of the function space. And in fact, for the theorists in the audience, if you're interested, uh, this shows why uh, there, there's some new mathematical techniques we have to develop to show why the overfitting to G is mitigated in certain ways based on a new holder style equality for the Dudley integral for just the people that care about that kind of thing. So maybe just a couple of takeaways and then I can uh, maybe answer some questions. So the first takeaway is that vanilla empirical risk minimization is statistically adaptive. It adapts to different parts of the feature space that are easier or harder to learn. And this complements causal views of distribution shift where we look at confounding or other effects. Uh, the second takeaway is that this adaptivity of empirical risk minimization might suggest one of the reasons why it's such a strong baseline in distribution shift experiments, because it's picking out good parts of the feature space on its own without additional modification. And finally, kind of a meta point is that looking at statistical complexity can play an interesting role in distribution shift, where we focused on things like extrapolation and causal effects, but looking at the statistics might also give us orthogonal or complementary interest uh, insights that might be of use. So for my last slide, I want to just talk about some future directions that I've been thinking about in the space of distribution shift. So the first one is understanding extrapolation to unseen environments under structure, be that bilinear structure or additive structure. Uh, there are many kinds of structural assumptions under which we get, get, get uh, good generalization or can, can potentially get generalization. I think it's a major direction for open work, for, for future work to understand under what conditions these objects are possible. Uh, the second thing that I'm very excited about is distribution shift and feedback loops. When we're applying a, a predictor or something in an environment that's changing the environment, and that change in the environment is causing the input to that predictor to change as well. And I've been understanding this mostly from the perspective of robotic behavior cloning, but there are a ton of other scenarios in which this is the phenomena that's encountered. And then finally, maybe I'll end on this, is that there's been some really interesting interaction between how we optimize our models and the distribution shift itself. So in some work uh, with my collaborators at Microsoft Research, we found that certain kinds of training algorithms lead to more sensitivity or less sensitivity to distribution shifts when they're played in closed loop. In particular, the exponential moving average, which is a very common popular technique in, in deep learning, is necessary to ensure that um, uh, is necessary to ensure that uh, uh, predictors trained in closed loop, in fact, work really well. And other techniques like dropout or data augmentation don't don't ne uh, uh, nearly uh, don't nearly uh, replicate the performance of exponential moving average. And this is found both in behavior cloning environments, like simple Majoko environments, but we were also able to show that for natural, um, uh, uh, for various training algorithms involving language models, the same effect occurs. So there's something very special about how the model gets optimized that affects its resilience under perturbations that becomes exacerbated under closed loop. And there are, of course, a million other directions that are exciting in distribution shift, but I think for now, uh, we've got a bit of time, so I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks, Max, for a great talk. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yeah, we have we have definitely a few minutes. You can unmute yourself if you have a question. Ah, sorry, Sinwe asked a question. I'll, I'll let you moderate and ask. Yeah. Uh, okay. So she asked, "Any intuitions on why intentionally robustness methods break such property of ERM, e.g., the regular?" I think. That's a that's a that's a that's a great question. Uh, I think that um, that's a good that's a very good question. So it's not always the case that they're breaking this robustness property. Sometimes they're just not improving, but they're doing on par. I think the the problem is that many of these intentionally ro robust algorithms are designed for certain kinds of causal structures. So they 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 posit sort of a causal view of what the world looks like. Uh, and then they say, okay, if this was the case, how would I undo things? 
So if that causal structure is there, it's great, but oftentimes some other causal structure might be present that's maybe incompatible with the one for which they're designed. And so they have sort of a negative or, or, or sort of harmful inductive bias in those scenarios. And maybe ERM is so good that even in the cases where they're tailored to do really well, uh, ERM is, 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 or works really well. Uh, maybe a second point here is that it may be very, it might just be the case that the sort of generate, the generative process which causes these distribution shifts is not really reflected by any, any easy to define causal bias, except for very specific scenarios. I think medicine is typically the best one where causality is a really useful tool. But in, in the WILDS data set, they looked at things like distribution shifts to uh, different kinds of wheat plants or different kinds of animals in different sort of uh, climb, uh, different terrains. And there it becomes a, little, a much less clear to think about these in terms of causal shifts and more about shifts in the feature space where maybe statistics plays a bigger role. Hmm. Thank you. It makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. Yes. I think Andre, yeah. Maybe one small question. It was very interesting to um, learn about this bound, your novel bound that you put on G square. Um, in the terms you have F and G square, could it be possible to somehow also interchange? Is there any way to interchange also to put any bound on the F? This is maybe silly, but just wondering because you have yeah, yeah. F and G. You, 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 can, you can totally interchange this, right? So you can swap X. X and Y and F and G. Uh, I, I worked, I, I just gave this version because F is the simpler feature. So if you made this new X, Y, error G plus error F squared plus error F, this term would dominate. Uh, and then you would just be, you would just end up with error, error of G would be the dominating term. And then you would get what you would, you would recover uh, essentially, let me cover, where is this? Uh, you'd recover the naive bound because error G is a dominating term. So that's that's why I focused on the error f plus error g squared because if you got error g plus error f squared that would just recover this. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Of course. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, very nice talk. Uh, um, I'm wondering, yeah, so for this upper, if you want to achieve this ERM upper bound, you kind of need a worst case kind of perturbations uh, to you achieve this upper bound. And then I'm thinking in the wilds data set, there actually are some data sets like Chameleon 17 data set where you only have uh, five domains and then you only test uh, on one of the fifth uh, hospital. In those kind of cases, like uh, would, would this kind of bond still be helpful to ex explain the, the success of ERM or you actually look for other reasons? Uh, so well, I, I'm curious to understand what you mean by worst case. Um, like, oh, you mean like this new XY is a worst case perturbation? Yeah, yeah. that's a that's a very good point. So there's been some really good work with uh, uh, this this person, Reese Patak, who I work with, who understands, uh, who tries to understand very granular instance dependence distribution shifts for very structured classes of functions. Um, I would say the following: that the purpose of this bound is not to make uh, not to make sort of um, predictive confidence intervals on out of distribution performance. It's more to kind of elucidate a phenomena and kind of explain why ERM might have certain capabilities than others. Uh, in general, new XY is is a very loose is a very loose thing, and, and you and you typically shouldn't use it. And even in distribution generalization bounds, confidence bounds, I think is still a developing and growing growing topic. So getting one for out of distribution shift we, is a really big open problem. Uh, I, I see the purpose of this bound more explaining a mechanism rather than providing like a useful confidence or actionable confidence interval, if that makes sense. Um, but I still think that the mechanism does make sense in that ERM is going to learn uh, simpler features quickly. And so if you say, for example, in Waterbirds, if you shift the background, uh, you can you sort of ER, uh, ERM can kind of deal with deal with if deal with that more so than if you're sort of shifting very fine textured granular details. That makes sense. I'm happy to see one more question or we can see the floor to the next Maybe speaker. one more question, quick question, if there is one. There will be a um, discussion at the end. Oh, sorry. I have uh, maybe one quick question. So how, how do your results apply to the case where the test distribution has a different support as the training distribution? That's a good question. So in 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 yeah, as I disclaimer as I as a disclaimer I made at the beginning of the talk is that this was not different out of support and because I was on the job market this year and I had to make slides for other things and so I had to reuse slides that I already existed because I've been very busy. But uh, there are two scenarios where you can get out of support. 
So really this new XY, I wrote it as uh, as a um, likelihood ratio, but in fact, it suffices to look at the right likelihood ratio restricted to all sets that can be discriminated by functions F or G. So you can think about, so here's a, spe a specific case. In the case where say F is linear, for example, then you can get out of support generalization and it only depends on the covariance matrices, right? Because uh, it's, it, and so there are more general versions of this. If they were polynomial classes, then it would only depend on the changes in the moments and so on and so forth. So that's the most natural application of the bound. I think though, if you wanna understand um, uh, sort of true out of support distribution, uh, you need to have some sort of structure that you can reason about, at least mathematically, that's the most that we know how to do now. So that could be something like, there's been work now understanding causal structure and Markov chains with transformer architectures from Jason Lee's group. Uh, I've done some work on bilinear optimization. Uh, there's been work from Teng Yuma and Kifang Dong on, on additive classes. So in those places, st structure can buy you uh, really, really, um, can buy you true out of support generalization. I think moving beyond explicit structure and having unstructured architectures recover explicit structure is a really exciting direction for future work. But I think that we're only in the early days of understanding this phenomena properly. Great question. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Max. Uh, yes. Could you share now your screen so, as I introduce you? Just a sec. Uh, okay. Do you see my screen? Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, okay, uh, so next up we have uh, Mo Lutfalahi. Uh, he is an incoming faculty at the uh, Welcome Sanger Institute and CCAIM at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he was a director of machine learning research at Relation Therapeutics and also member of ELLIS. He aims to leverage AI and advanced experimental techniques to engineer cells and modulate their response and disease and perturbations and translate, it, translate them for diagnostic therapeutics and drug discovery. He's been a recipient of many awards. Um, he received his PhD in computational biology at T TU Munich and Helmholtz Munich um, under the su supervision of Fabian Theis. Um, so like uh, Max, he's uh, going to have 25 minutes and he's going to take the questions mm -hmm. afterwards. Uh, so let's welcome Mac, uh, Mo. Awesome. Thank you, Armin. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, thank you much for, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about um, essentially applications of machine learning uh, in, 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 in auto distribution prediction across cells and patients. And uh, just just to give you a bit of like um, insight, what we're working on is uh, we're um, throughout the talk, most of the data modalities that I'll show you is, are based on what we call single cell biology. So essentially, what 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 the data come from is uh, let's let's imagine we take a sample from our brain, and then we know that there are uh, this sample actually is comprised of many cells. So let's say we isolate one cell and then we extract inf different information from that cell that could be like gene expression how the dna looks like where that cell is in the tissue so they coordinate the the expression of different proteins and so on and then we would like to see how these different data modalities change in response to disease or in response to different treatments so essentially we're, we're discussing a, a multimodal setting where instead of having images, text, and those type of stuff, we have different modalities that we get from the cell, right? And um, so uh, throughout my talk, um, actually, I had one more slide that was skipped. No, here, yeah. Oh, um, I'm sorry, so, yeah, yeah. the slides weren't showing. Now, can you see it now? Yeah, we can see your slides. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, uh, throughout this talk, I'll talk about, uh, I think four major topics that our lab is working on. First, the first question is like how to integrate these, these different type of data modalities into one unified reference of cells. So we are creating these references for different tissues. So how to integrate them and then how to distribute and also make them usable for the community. Let's say if you're a biologist and you want to download the pre-trained model, and map your own data on the top of the pre-trained model, then it allows you to, you know, transfer knowledge from a reference single cell data set to a query data set. The second challenge is 
um, now zoom in into individual cells and and like apply and design generative AI models to predict the cellular behaviors in response to perturbations, be it drug, be it disease and so on. And finally, you would like to zoom out of it and see where these cells are, are in the tissue. So basically the locations of these tissue, because these cells, they're not working in isolation. So they're talking to each other. So where they are and localized is very important. So you want to understand the signaling that happens between these cells and the tissue. And finally, let's say you kind of like, I, I kind of showed you a hierarchy. You go from like cell types to cells to the tissue. And now a collection of tissues and organ create an organism, which is a human. And then we would like to use all of these data modalities to predict, let's say, how a patient would respond um, to a treatment as a whole, right? And um, so for, first I'll start, I, I mean, we don't have much time, but I'll start with the first part. So how to create, I'll just show you examples. I won't go deep into the method because I think for the like for, for the audience here, it would be nice to kind of get to know a bunch of these problems. Maybe you're a smarter people and you can like solve them better than us. Or, uh, but I'll, I'll show you one example, like how this works and especially for the, what we call reference mapping. So reference mapping is, let's say you train a model that integrates or basically corrects the domain effect across different experiments. And now you have a new data set, which we call query. So you have a pre-trained model that was trained on a data set that comes from single cell across multiple labs. So there is domain effect. So you corrected that domain effect, what we call also batch effect. And now you're given the pre-trained model. And now you want to, given this pre-trained model and a new data set, you would like to fine tune this new data, this new model uh, with this query data, so with the green data set, such that the domain effect between the query and the reference um, is is solved, so basically it's corrected. And here there are three um, criteria. A, you're oh, not allowed hey, to use the reference data. Hey Mo, uh, are you are you changing the slides by any chance? Because we're not seeing any. You've always, oh, really okay. you've been fixed in the same slide for five minutes. Oops. Sorry. Yeah, maybe, maybe I wasn't sure. Um, okay, now you should probably see my. Now, do you see my slides? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe, um, can you go back a slide? Okay, sorry. Yeah, we we never saw this. So you've seen this one, right? Oh no, no. Oh really? That would have, okay. that would have been nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe, okay. Okay. So this is the where I talked about different modalities, right? So this okay. is this is basically where we get multiple data sets, and then, um. These are basically different topics that I talked about. So making the models available, predicting cell type behaviors, looking at the tissue, and then going and predicting it at patient level. And, and uh, so this is the setting that I was talking about. Given a pre-trained model um, that was trained on all of these data modalities or a bunch of these, if we have a new data set, because this happens all the time, so you're basically generating data for new patients, right? And now you want to map this data on the top of the, you know, the, you want to map it to the previous patient representation. And then you want to transfer some information from the reference data set to the query. That reference data set could be either annotating individual cells in the query data set or annotating the whole patient, because annotation is very expensive in this domain, right? So every single cell that you annotate here, it requires an expert to annotate, and then it will take a lot of times because you have to take these representations, cluster them, go back to the experts, see what differentiate between different clusters and so on. So this was the this was the topic of like uh, one of the uh, PhD papers that I had. Uh, it's called SC Arches. Um, I'm not going to talk about it. Just just like introducing the problem, but I'll show you one example how it's used by the community. So um, here, a bunch of researchers. I think like is it is is a consortia called Human Cell Atlas. So a lot of universities are part of this, and also pharma and like um, research institutes. The goal of this um, consortia is to create um, something like Google Map for different organs in our body. So we would like to know where each cell is in each organ and then how they behave in health and disease. And now what they've done for this was they collected a lot of data from human lung across many labs and then um, they integrated into uh, one reference and throughout 
two years, they they basically used the this this architecture surgery and fine tuning strategy that we proposed to map new data that comes from new hospitals, new universities on the top of this manifold, right? And then um, in the end, the, they integrated 46 data set across 445 different individuals, 2 million cells across different lung diseases. So how do people use it in practice? Why is it useful? Because the way that we designed it, it can separate the technical variation across different labs and also novel disease effect that, or disease or maybe like, like even novel cell population that might be in your query data set, but not in your reference. So if you map data, the things that you have seen in the training, um, very similar to the training um, data will be integrated. And if it, there is a novel cell state or novel cell population or novel disease state, it will basically separate out from the rest. That, that's the rationale. And these, these representations that you see here are UMAP representation of the latent embedding of this, this method. So like 2D representation of the embeddings that you get from these methods. And on the gray is the reference. And then on the blue is this query data set using, um, uh, that was mapped using our method called SCRHs. And using, after the mapping, what they did, uh, they trained a very simple canon classifier on the manifolds on the latent space to transfer the, the cell type annotations from the reference to the query data set. And um, using this, they drive a um, kind of like distance-based um, uncertainty metric where wherever there was more confusion on the cell types, there was a higher uncertainty. And then in this manifold, there are parts of this, like in the latent space, there are parts that they got high uncertainty. And their assumption in that paper was like, wherever we got a high uncertainty because the model did not integrate them, it's either the model failed because it couldn't integrate and remove the domain effect, or there is a novel cell state that actually didn't integrate, right? And they, uh, so this paper is published in Nature Medicine. What they looked at was indeed, uh, indeed the parts that were, they observe high uncertainty. Those are the region that actually the model predicted wrong cell type for the cells in the query. And those were actually novel cell states that were only present in the query data set and not in the reference. So by contextualizing their data set into this map and see, because this map is so comprehensive, they could identify novel cell states in long that they were not observed before. And um, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll, so this slide shows another example, that is another publication in Cell, which they also use this application here, but this time to map disease data on the top of a developmental data set. So they actually collected brain data from very early um, gestational ages throughout development and adulthood. And what they did was map disease data. So in this case, glioblastoma. And what happens is many of the um, disease programs that get activated in, in lethal cancers, they actually have roots in early development. So what they wanted to see if, if there are states that they will be integrated into the reference, which was in human development, and they actually show why the disease happened, right? And they could go after that. And another application of this is um, to test um, experimental brain models, because essentially you can't do these drug screening on the human rights. If there's, there's a disease patient, you can't do that. So that's why they create the, these brain organoids in the lab. And they want to know how good their organoid models, so these mini brains are, compared to the real brain data. So that's what they also map it into the brain, the real brain data. And if it integrates, it shows that it kind of recapitulates the, um, the the brain biology. And if it kind of separates, then it kind of gives them hint that there is something wrong with this with their experimental brain model, and they can go in the lab and then you know, optimize the protocols such, such that they create a better model of the brain. Um, okay, so just, just to know how much time do I have because... Um... Uh, uh, 10 minutes at least. 10 minutes, 10 minutes. okay, great. Um, awesome, so the next example that I'll show is, is on um, predicting organism level um, Phenotypes. So basically, given a patient and multi-omic data, so multi-model data from those patients, for every single cell of that patient, can you predict the outcome 
um, of, of the treatment or the, the disease severity for that patient. So that's the problem setting here. So we get a lot of data from single cells across different patients. And uh, if you want to contextualize this in a machine learning problem, it's very similar to the weekly supervised setting. So we where we um, know the label for the whole patient, but we don't know the individual labels for every cell because we don't know whether the disease affected that cell or not. But we know that the patient actually got a disease, right? And um, so what we did is we designed a generative model. So this is still work in progress that can integrate across these different modalities using a mixture of expert architecture and then integrates them into a unified latent space across these different modalities um, and, um, and, 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 and data types. And, um, and then after this, it will become very similar to the weekly supervised multi-instance learning classification, where instead of like having patches of images inside um, a bag, you have actually cells from the same patient inside a bag. And now you want to score cells, you want to predict the label of this bag, but also score cell to see which cell is actually important for the disease phenotype. So to automatically score and rank cells. And why is it important? because it can automatically tell you about the importance of certain cell type for every patient in each disease. And then it could potentially give you a hint about the drug target or how to treat that disease, right? And um, I'll show you one example, um, how we apply this method on a, um, a data set um, from a healthy lung uh, and also patient 120 patients with healthy and IPF. So IPF is a fibrosis. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a disease that happened along, right? And it caused fibrosis. And uh, what we did first, we compared this method with, with other ways of classifying patients. For example, you can average across every cell type and every patient, and, and then you can aggregate them and predict the cell type um, variability. You can do, you can count the number of cells in, in healthy and, and diseased patients and see the change between the different, the frequency of the cells in healthy and patient and create a classifier based on that. You can, I mean, there are different strategies. So what we show is this approach works better than those, but I think the key, the key added value here is um, it will extract knowledge from the data. So you're training these models on, on data sets with 5 million cells across hundreds of patients and, and what we did here, this accuracy is actually on, on unseen patients. So these are data from like 20 unseen patients that test. And the, if, you, if you go back and then look at the interpretability of this method, so this attention mechanism that, that aggregates across ba uh, different bags, it actually highlights um, a group of cells. If you look at the bottom row, so um, these, these group of red cells that you see, these are actually scored by clinicians and biologists for the presence of fibrosis. So these are scores that like, and, and genes that people look into to, to identify the cells affected by fibrosis. And then we can see the model actually picked up the same exact cells. If you look at the attention, it kind of highlighted the same region to be important for, um, for the disease. But what can you do with this? What you could do is now after you got those important cells, then you can do some downstream analysis to see what are the genes, what are the features that are driving these, these um, cells versus the healthy cells. And then based on this, you can extract a bunch of other genes that were not included in the initial gene model defined by the experts, right? So you can get more insight about a disease this way. And um, I think in five minutes, if I have five minutes, do I? Okay. In the last part, um, then I'll show you some vignettes about models that we've designed um, to predict cellular behavior. So these are generative models that um, can generate cells. So transcriptomically, so you, you can basically ask this model, these, these type of models to generate cells if they were perturbed with the drug A or genetic perturbation B and so on, right? And um, the reason that we do this in this domain is um, because these experiments are, are uh, quite expensive and you don't know the target for the drug. So you basically have a patient that was diseased and then you want to find a drug if you apply it on the cells from this patient that can rever reverse the effect of the disease and push the cells toward the healthy cells, right? 
but then you have the, the search space is is um, almost um, infinite because you have all the molecules in the world to test, right? So you want to narrow down the hypothesis space here and then fill the gap using a generative model that can generate cells. And this way you can do experiment design. That's what we do in my lab. So basically having a, um, um, having a lot of chemical perturbation and genetic perturbation you would like to see which perturbation would engineer cells toward a certain phenotype, right? And then you go in the lab and do the experiment and then generate more data. And now it's it's very similar to the active learning setting that you now add more data and go in the lab, test it and so on, right? And um, so one of the, the 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 latest architecture we developed for this were, uh, was is called CPA. So like we have different variations of this published in NeurIPS and, and also journals. Um, this one, this was the work when I was working at Facebook AI. Uh, we, we developed this method. Uh, and if this met this what the, the, this method receives, let's say cell A. And this cell re re received two perturbations, so two drugs, and it also come from this, this orange cell type. What it learns is to decompose the cell into different components in the latent space and put them back and reconstruct the gene expression. And at the test time, then what you could do is, um, is to ask these type of counterfactuals, if you have cell A treated with these two perturbations, and now you wanna test how, how this cell uh, would respond if it was treated with three other different drugs. And then you can, you know, on this exact cell generate the gene expression if it was perturbed uh, with it, and you can sample from distances a genetic model. Um, what this model actually learns is, um, so I'm doing this in both academia and industrial setting. So um, spoiler alert, not, most of these uh, lab in the loop stuff doesn't work. And um, so it's a very challenging problem. And um, and 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 this 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 idea that I started um, I mean, since there was discussion with about like IRM and those things. So my, my supervisor at Facebook was David Lopez. So he was like this, this guy with IRM. We actually started with causal perturbation outing quarter, but the causal part never worked. So that's why we made it compositional perturbation outing quarter. So it's like, in, it just like as, 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 as it would be good to know about like, you know, the limitations of whatever we do in theory. So most of them won't work. And, um, so for those of you who are developing new methods, applied on real data, um, and 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 um, I think would be quite surprising results that you might get. And um, so long story short, what we get from the output of this method, because we learned the similarity ac across different perturbations, the model learned if two drug is actually similar to one another or not. So if two drugs stimulate the cells in a certain way or a very similar way, they will be embedded because we have a cell space and we also have a perturbation space or so intervention space. So these are embeddings in the intervention space as, as they were learned throughout the training. Using this, um, we actually designed a second experiment, uh, but not doing fancy, you know, active learning or lab in the loop because none of these things work for us. And so what we did was um, we actually manually um, annotated this, this this perturbation map. And so with experts, then we identified drugs. So somewhere in this map, there is a dot, <laughs> though I can't see it, there's a dot that, that correspond to control. So these are the unperturbed cells. And if you deviate from that, that A shows you, you your drug had an effect. And then we would like to pick the drugs and combine them in a way that these drugs and the ways that they affect cells would, would lead to a synergy. And that's what we did. So we basically picked 32 drugs and combination of those drugs and went and do, did a second experiment. And then we generated data from the second experiment, fine tuning the model. And what we showed was um, we, we, we can actually predict the outcome of combinatorial treatment at single cell level. And um, this was, I think, a year ago that was published, but now there are like a lot of cool work done by other people that actually improved upon this. and. Um, so data set that we generate is also there. Um, so we do all of these stuff also on images because you can actually get a, an image of a cell and you can apply the drug and you can check how this cell and the shape of the cell will change. So the morphology of the cell. So we also develop generative models um, to, to actually generate and 
predict counterfactuals on on um, on images. So and then we compared. Um, so we have different families of these models, like flow matching, diffusion, and so on. And, but it, it, and when you compare it, this is this is a very practical setting because in the lab there are companies like Recursion, a bunch of other companies that are doing these type of experiments. So very important, and I think um, worth attention also from the ML community to work on these type of stuff. And um, yeah, so a bunch of the work that I showed you. So it's not just like some ML, but also works. You know, they are used in companies and also in academia. And if 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 um if anyone is interested, um yeah, please uh, feel free to reach out. So it was the work of many peoples and funders, and I have postdocs, PhD positions, everything available. So if anyone is interested, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Mo, uh, for the nice talk. Any questions from the audience? We have a few minutes. Um, yeah, um, very cool applications. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, um, so, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, it, it, yeah, it's very nice. Uh, you, I'm kind of curious about this kind of, uh, when you learn a latent representation via neural network or when you generate an image via those uh, neural networks and you apply it for science, mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, it's like, uh, uh, if I if I use the data, same data, and I slightly modify the more neural network architecture, I might get slightly different results. And I'm curious, like, uh, how do you interpret when you try to interpret the latent space or you try to interpret those images you generate uh, using like a generative model with uh, some uh, disease? And how do you separate uh, what is the real structure you learn from the data? And then how, what is the part that, that might be due to artifacts uh, of uh, neural networks? Yeah. And how do you actually explain to people that uh, that might be possible? And how, how do you make, make sure that what you really interpret interpret only the the parts that uh, is real uh from the data so i think yeah. it's very it's, it's very context dependent right and um so for example in the case of generating omic data so where you have a let's say twenty thousand dimensional gene expression vector um so there are like quantitative metrics so i didn't show a bunch of those but in the end we there is this is very similar to distribution matching problem so you can use a bunch of the distribution matching metrics like EMD, um, like MMD, whatever distribution matching metric is your favorite, you can apply those. But then there are also important features within these cells that differentiate them from the unperturbed or healthy conditions. So what we do also do additionally is we focus on those features too that are more meaningful instead of like the other the background features. And then we compare how well. So these are the differential signal most of the time that is different between a perturb and unperturb. And then, um, so sometimes it's just like, it pops up out of like automatic analysis, but sometimes also given by experts. And then you can check those features and how you kind of predicted those features, right? And 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 then generally, most of the things that I showed and whatever we do in, 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 in medical and also in this day's biological domain, Everything which is interesting is out of distribution. So whatever is in distribution is boring in biology because it just happens all the time, right? And um, so I think there's a lot of need to create benchmarks and also, you know, just write metrics to evaluate. And um, and there are lots of people actually working. And so we're also organizing a bunch of like NURBS competitions. And there's a there's a platform called openproblem.bio where we actually generate data and then a bunch of these, uh, these questions are, you know, it's kind of like kaggled there. Um, so a lot of people can can attempt, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, quick question for Andre, if it's quick. Thank you, it will be quick. On one slide, you showed the neural network architecture with the encoder, decoder part and so on. How extendable is this also in terms of the generative AI say to transformer like architectures and similar? Yeah, um, so now people are actually training this quite on scale. So the encoder, they change it on trans to transformer. So there are like different variations of this. And um, so I think there are versions that like people have trained in a, like, you know, 30 million cells. And so, so um, it, it, there is a lot of like, th this is an active area of research and a lot of people actually improved it. So, but it, like short answer, it scales. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Yeah, we'll have more discussions at the end. Uh, so maybe uh, we can have the 
TJ. Sure, I can pull up the slides. Okay. Uh, so while she pulls it up, um, Jijin is a PhD student at Max Planck Institute in ATH. I think she's about to graduate. Uh, her research focuses on socially responsible natural language processing by causal inference, developing causal NLP methods to improve robustness, fairness, and interpretability, as well as causal analysis of social problems. Like the previous speaker, she's received many awards, a um, couple of Rising Star Awards. Um, her work has been published in many top places, um, and so we're excited to hear her talk. She's okay getting some clarifying questions during the talk, uh, but leaving kind of the more longer questions at the end. So the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Armin, for the welcoming introduction. Uh, I also try to make my talk relatively concise. So uh, yeah, welcome. My talk is on the topic of a paradigm shift in addressing distribution shifts, insights from LMs. So the outline of my talk will consist of uh, first a traditional formulation of distribution shift, then diving into how the era of large language models bring in a paradigm shift of how we formulated the problem or how we address the problem. Uh, specifically, I will cover uh, the first effect uh, on the power of interpolation in this stage of LMs, and then the second one, which is still uh, in question in our community, but there is hope for extrapolation and we'll see will it happen. Uh, lastly, I will end up with some future directions. So briefly, uh, as which is already introduced in our first talk, uh, the traditional formulation of distribution shift is that in the training domain, we have data conforming to a certain distribution. And then we're thinking about how to make the best use with inductive bias or with different constraints uh, so that it could generalize better in the other domain. Uh, a shift in the formulation in the era of large language model uh, is mainly about, will anything be different given such large data and the large model size? Specifically, uh, one emerging phenomena is that there is like, the approach of LMs is to like increase the, the source domain of all the, to include all the available text document. And then the power of interpolation with this will naturally grow. The second effect is whether there will be potential extrapolation emerge from such large scale, which is the so-called emergence of intelligence. Um, and also behind this formulation or behind like, oh, which one should we pay more attention to if people are thinking about, does it mean that we should just put more effort into getting larger and larger text data with RLHF or with different sources, uh, then it's mainly about like maybe people are targeting at some practical use in well-defined scenarios and it's fine to just interpolate. Or are we curious about theoretical properties? So maybe the essence of the, the, the problem too is what we care about and so on. It depends on the motivation behind the researcher or the application scenario. So diving into the first part, power of interpolation. Uh, as we mentioned, like LIM success lies in including all possible training data from web pages to uh, code, social media, papers, books, and so on. Based on this, we will be able to see certain behavior of LIM, such as when I ask the when I query the model last weekend, um, please give me three examples of the explaining away effect. Then it will answer certain things that are that are pretty uh, reasonable to me. Like uh, there's this smoke detector example, white grass example, flu symptoms example, and so on. And I would trace the success of such answer to that probably these examples are somewhere on the website or in the books. So it's like the memory heavy ability of LM made them succeed in queries such as these. Another type of query uh, is not direct memorization, but simple interpolation. One example of this is uh, I composed the question, suppose you are on Mars. 
what would you do when you first visit your Martian girlfriend's parents for the first time? And then I will give some other relatively okay answers like dress appropriately in Mars specific attire, bring a traditional Earth gift and so on. So how I would decompose this answer, which maybe a lot of the users will feel, okay, it's cool to me. Uh, but I would trace it to the sources because I type in Google search, um, well, what a person usually do when meeting with his or their girlfriend's parents, uh, or what are some ethic rules if you visit someone's home in a foreign country, some, so some with some cultural shift. And I, it's probably a simple compilation of this, the, those answers and then uh, trying to swap the like foreign culture with Mars culture and so on. So with this, like the next question we want to bring forward is given all these impressive ability that made a lot of users already amazed at those LMs, what are the key researcher, research questions for us? So I would say that the ambitious question behind with a large step size of research advancement is what does it mean? Can we redefine interpolation for LMs? Namely, formalize it in the context of those text operations or so on, and then prove given an LM, I just give you all the weights. Are you able to prove what it has already been learned? Um, although this is not, actually tackled in the current literature, it's like really hard to be tracked. Um, the actionable question that I bring forward and many of our NLP community try to proceed forward with is a tractable step size, like how do we test the limits of interpolation? And then we need to accumulate enough evidence before approaching the harder question. Uh, so in terms of testing LMs as a paradigm in NLP, uh, as we mentioned, we have a lot of training data from different text sources. And then in the test setting, uh, as we mentioned, this bringing in unseen data. When we try to compose unseen data to test LMs, uh, there are two types of tasks. One is formal reasoning tasks, uh, and not formal reasoning tasks, such as social intelligence, like visiting girlfriend's family, and also formal reasoning tasks, such as math. So the pros and cons, and I introduced the pros and cons and also why most of my work focus on evaluating its formal reasoning. So although non-formal reasoning seems very attractive, uh, there are some inherent problems such as uh, it could be largely covered by memorization or simple interpolation. Um, and then if we try to collect unseen data, we probably need some costly effort and to compose the questions and to ensure that the human subjects didn't use ChatGPT to behave like an annotator and get the money. Uh, the third point is it's hard to agree on a perfect evaluation. Like for example, in the visiting a girlfriend family case, like what do the parents care about? Uh, do they like gifts or do they not like gifts? And then like, there are a lot of background information that hadn't been stated. So that's unlikely to be a formal answer. Or in the case of, please write a fantasy story for me, it's hard to score the given answer and a human written answer. This function itself is not trivial. Then moving into the formal reasoning realm, the advantages are we can generate questions that are unseen because we generate by programs um, uh, to have them. And then the evaluation metric is clear and unambiguous in most of the cases. So moving into how we operationalize it, uh, first uh, we have touched we have touched upon three formal tests in the past years. The first one is simple arithmetics, where we go through mass word problems and we systematically change the numbers uh, so that we cover data that has been unseen in the existing corpus. The other type of task that we generate by program is causal discovery task in the text format. So we basically mention inputs such as, we know A correlates with B or both dependence and independence as the inputs and then ask the question, can we infer that A causes B? And then we have yes, no, or maybe. So the, uh, the third one is a causal reasoning, which is a quantitative version uh, where we know the causal graph, we know their statistical distributions. Uh, can you answer whether X leads to an increase in Y? 
So here we programmatically designed the data to swap the variable names X, Y, Z or W. And we also plug in the uh, exact distribution number um, and then ask this question. Uh, so this is our clutter paper, which we're, we have presented in last in Europe 2023. So also some brief uh, look into the result as a lot of us are curious, how well do LMs perform on those? So uh, for the questions in our clutter data set, we have designed it to be yes, no questions with a uniform distribution. So the random baseline is 50%. And as we go through different LM performance, we see that even the uh, latest GPT-4 only achieves 62%, whereas the perfect accuracy by a symbolic solving engine is 100%. And the human performance, when we uh, tried it with some grad students who have taken causality courses, is 80% accuracy. So it will show that, it, it does show that LM has difficulty over formally grounded reasoning tasks um, that are generated uh, as unseen data. And then to proceed forward, we also suggest the future LM to have a more structured way of reasoning given a formal question. In the context of causal reasoning, uh, we have proposed a causal chain of thought prompting to lead guide LM to understand the causal graph, formulate the query, collect statistics, uh, going through formal causal inference steps, uh, doing the proper arithmetics before arriving at the answer. And with this, we improved our, uh, we improved upon GPT-4 by eight point accuracy. Uh, although because the entire uh, engine is still based on LMs, there's still space to improve. Specifically, the areas to improve is one, translating from the natural language text to the formalized query, especially uh, specifying what to control for and what to vary. And the other is to perform the right formal causal inference steps. Then uh, quickly diving into the second uh, path on the hope for extrapolation. Uh, so basically, if a lot of people are paying attention to this like so-called emergence of intelligence, basically people are uh, have belief upon two things. One is the belief in the scaling law, namely larger the model size or more um, more data, the better the performance on a certain task. And then the second one is uh, the grokking uh, evidence. So there are various training evidence where people see um, here is a simple uh, accuracy curve where the blue curve is the training accuracy and the red curve is test accuracy uh, and the yeah, and what they show is actually like, even if the training data got overfit, uh, after long enough training, there will be like the test accuracy will sort of uh, stumble a bit. And then there is a hope that the test accuracy can also get to perfect, which means that there is a set of uh, hypotheses in this hypothesis class. And then after overfitting, the model can still explore different hypotheses and then end up with the perfect one which is also reflected in the loss curve, where the smaller, the better. Um, with these two hope, we now gather uh, experimental evidence. So the current experimental evidence are into two types. The first is math operations, very simple math operation. We're not yet ready to tackle uh, complicated ones. And the second is very simple text operation. So in the math operation, we see it in, um, the iClear 2023 paper in that they're able to decompose modular addition in a one layer transformer and map the relation of A plus B mod a certain number into actually within some of the neurons, it transforms A and B to a four real basis and perform the thing that's identical to this modular addition. Um, similarly, uh, other papers has also explored greater than relation and so on. In the context of my paper, I explore simple text operations, such as the copy, copy a word action and knowledge recall, which I will introduce in our uh, competition of mechanisms paper. So in this paper, we look into basically examples such as 
if we redefine iPhone as developed by Google, now I ask the question, iPhone was developed by, and I would expect the chatbot to answer Google. Although there are also cases where chatbot would confuse and still answer the factually correct one, uh, Apple. So basically we look into, like we highlight this competition of two mechanisms, where the first mechanism is about, uh, given the text, we have a factual knowledge recall that iPhone should be developed by Apple and then say Apple upfront. So um, does have a tendency to do so and it's reflected in its internal layers. The second mechanism here is about understanding this counterfactual statement in that it's unreal, like, but we say it, like we redefine it as this one. And then we align this in context new statement of iPhone uh, in our answer. So what we have done is mechanistically interpret how the two mechanisms emerge. And then we open the GPT-2 small model with 12 layers uh, of transformer architecture and more than 100 million parameters. So what we do is that we inspect what happened in each layer. And specifically, we pay attention to where the knowledge recall happened and where this like uh, copying the this token happened. So in on the knowledge recall side, when the transformer encounter each occurrence of iPhone, then immediately in the first uh, like layer zero, in the first MLP layer, multi-layer perceptron layer, it already has a high knowledge recall corresponding to the word Apple. So iPhone triggers Apple with a high probability. And then another circuit that's happening within the transformer is that the word Google has been copied by an induction circuit. So the attention layer pays a strong attention to the word Google. Um, and then it was like incorporated in the later calculation. Finally, there are some uh, later layers which trades off whether it should pay more attention to the counterfactual token or the factual one, the uh, the the correct knowledge recall apple, and then before, like finally, it will generate the final prediction token. Uh, saving some details, you are welcome to check our paper for the exact uh, mechanistic details. Just a highlight of the result, and then we dive into the future direction. So the highlight of the re result is that after we identify where this knowledge recall uh, is intense in in the neural network. We also perform intervention in that we take out uh, two attention hats that we identify play a big role in the knowledge recall and then enlarge the value of these weights. Then we find that as a result, like the factual recall function is largely enhanced. And as a like the final in the final prediction, uh, this factual token, namely Apple, this token's dominance changes from 4% to 50% across the examples that we test the model with. Uh, so with this uh, looking ahead, the open questions we see nowadays will be uh, the interplay between behavioral test as we use a lot of empirical experiment to test our own behavior and intrinsic mechanistic understanding of it. And the next question is about how should we set our scientific standard for simple versus complex systems? As simple systems, I refer to those where we have hope to theoretically solidly understand them and then formulate them nicely. By complex system, I mean those where we have limited scientific understanding, but there are lots of empirical experiments we can do. This, was, this has been the case for psychology, human behavior, and so on. And this would also be the case for LIMs at first sight. Um, so lastly, I think uh, I hope my talk to open the discussion on how the development of RMs imply for the field of statistics and broader evolution of AI. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Jijing, uh, for a nice talk. Any questions from the audience?
I have a question about the um, uh, the first part when you were talking about the 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 causal mechanism being added to the LLMs um, and the improved performance when the one where you went from sixty two to seventy. Can you describe how um, what 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 goes in there a little bit a little bit about the the mechanism and how you set it up? Um, sure. Yeah. Well, maybe a little bit more information here. Yeah, thank you for the question. So basically, nowadays, uh, the context is that we try to instruct LMs in a structured way of thinking. So we basically like have a chain of prompts, such as given this question where we describe uh, things, we first ask first, uh, in the first step, can you answer me what, it, what, are, what is the causal graph mentioned in this text? And then like after LM come up with, oh, I think here in this case, X called. Z causes X, Z causes Y, X causes Y. Then ask, given this, can you formulate the query? Like, let's say, if the query is, does vaccination lead to an increase in the survival rate, given maybe a uh, previous physical uh, state of the patient, then, like, we would let them um, formulate the query as, oh, it is about an average treatment effect where... Uh, the variable that has been intervened on is the X variable and then what should be controlled for and so on. Uh, it's sort of like a, we still let LM answer it, but we ask it sub questions one by one. Uh, and then finally, we would also say like, oh, given the statistics, given the formula, the query, given the causal graph, can you use the calculus to solve for it? I see. But do you, so the, the graph here, you, you give it the graph, right? So this is something that you present to the framework yourself, or is that something that's learned in advance? So we sort of tried uh, two approaches. Uh, so far, the paper presents a closed book setting. So it's similar to an exam question to students where the graph is given. Uh, in our exploration process, we tried to let LM come up with a common sense. Mm. Uh, like if you're talking about survival rate, what's the physical background of the patient do you need to care about? Do you need to list? And it's promising as its own direction as well. I see. And what's the, like in, in your mind, uh, what's the the upper limit or or is there an upper limit in for the interpolation um, accuracy for LLMs in some sense? Like, do you think just given the current technology and given the current like computational power, is there an upper limit on what we can attain? Or what are like the big, big things that we need to solve to get to the higher percentages? I think you said like 80% are humans, right? And we're at 72 using these more right. common What's the, what are the big things remaining to get to 80% or beyond? Uh, I think uh, I would separate the question to two types. The first type of task is those that humans, as we can teach our students a template for solving these questions. I think those questions have a high likelihood to be solved. Let's say the run two call the question, like the do calculus, where there's a close solution. Mm -hmm. And I think the limit will be creative problem solving, where it might be a complicated combination of different operations. So uh, I would say that, for example, as we mentioned, uh, as we mentioned here, it will mean like, what do we mean by interpolation? If it's simple, copy that placeholder to here, substitute that one with this number, then it's within the limit of LMs. Uh, if it's about I got recommended the the book like the the proofs from the book, and I think it's if it's creative uh, math solving or creative problem solving, I think it's a much larger search space out of the limit of um, interpolation. Mm. I see. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other last minute questions before we transfer to the discussion? All right, um, I don't see any questions. Okay, good. So uh, now we'll move on to Nikolai. So Nikolai uh, can share his slides. Okay, so I, 
All right. I don't maybe can need you to hear me. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, I don't need to introduce Nikolai. He um he is a very prominent figure in statistics, um, distinguished figure in statistics. He is at ETH uh in seminar for statistics. Um he his work has uh been uh really instrumental in progress in um high dimensional statistics and causal inference, um, for the intersection of machine learning and statistics. Most recently, he's uh, he's worked a lot on climate applications and kind of the application of extrapolation and uh, domain generalization in climate uh, analysis. And he's um, also worked on extrapolation uh, with great work with uh, Xinwei, um, as well as other um, things. So in, in any case, we're very lucky to have uh, Nikolai as our discussant. And so the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I want to keep this rather short, but first I want to say thanks to you as uh, the organizers for, for this great event and and especially also for the speakers. I really enjoyed, enjoyed the three talks. Uh, they were quite diverse, but really uh, quite eye-opening. So, okay, uh, this is not coming out as I wanted to. Anyway, um, Here's a possible incomplete summary kind of as I write it that um when it is so just kind of listening to the talks one gets the impression that all the, the fancy kind of the main generalization tools and all the so robustness methods don't actually work. And the best you can do is just pull all the data you have, collect as much data as you can and fit an ERM to it. Especially that's the impression from the first talk. Um, and there could be, of course, many reasons why that is true, if it is true. And one reason could be the diversity of distribution shifts, which was alluded to here before as well. It could be distributions can change because of phase measurement change. There can be active interventions. The the noise can change. You measure kind of different hospitals in different countries. There can be latent confounding, which is changing. And it's really hard to pick the right distributional change you want to protect yourself against. And it's also hard to learn it from the data. This could be one reason. And then to look for, for, uh, forward to hear your opinion on that. The second one is what I call the price of insurance. So if you build a distributionally robust method, then you're kind of paying a price to protect you against a distributional change. So, so you, you tend to look at the worst case, um, a worst case kind of scenario, and you want to protect yourself against that distributional change. And as a result, often you don't need that protection because the worst case doesn't happen that often. And so you're buying an insurance, which you don't need. Like if you buy kind of fire insurance in your house, so luckily it doesn't burn down, well, then, then you still pay the price for that by a, a slightly diminished predictive accuracy. The third reason might be pure magic, which was mostly the context of the third talk in a sense that you say, okay, I just take as much data as I can for and LLM and I pull over this vast amount of data and then I hope that some extrapolation will emerge from that eventually if just I have enough data for that. Um, and so in this context, I wanted to ask three specific questions to the speakers. And maybe I can show all of them. So the first one for Jijin is, I mean, you talked about LLMs and the question is, what is the right way kind of forward? Is it one way could be, okay, you just collect more and more data and you build larger and larger kind of foundational models. And I think we've, we've seen in your slides, so you showed, okay, the, the performance of LLMs is not that good, but it was actually improving as you went from GPT-2 to GPT-3.5 to 4 it actually got better. And is that maybe also a possible way forward to just uh, use more and more data, make the models larger and larger? Or do you think kind of what you showed 
to tweak the model in very specific ways to make them, for example, more robust to the types of, of questions you ask, is that kind of the right, the right path for the field? The other approach would be, okay, let's go deep into specific applications and really understand at a very detailed level why and if a distributional shift occurs. And well, I, I think this is the approach that you showed. And I, I really, I really like that approach. My question is be would be like how much of the knowledge you gain do you expect to be then transferable to some other domains? Like if we follow that approach. Would we imagine that the fields would splinter in the end because each subfield would need the wrong kind of methodology? Or do you expect something which is generalizable to come out of that in the end? And the third possible approach is, okay, let's, let's think deeper about the theoretical aspects of extrapolation. And from that, something interesting is gonna emerge in terms of, of methodology as well. And and Max, I really like to talk about the decomposition. And my question would be, do you think something like a, a decomposition you showed or some other kind of theoretical advances can actually help shape the methodology we're going to see? Maybe let's start, start if it's OK, with Gigi and Khan going in, in reverse order. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Thank you so much, Nikolai, for the a uh, very nice prompt uh, to all of us. Um, so read the first question on the uh, limits of LMs. I think the the thing behind it would be like, maybe one of the common framing would be like, oh, we aim at a powerful chatbot. To achieve that chatbot, what would be the best uh, delta that we can do at the current moment? I see that in the past five years, that delta goes into scaling up the models. Uh, and we see amazing progress here. And then the question is like for the next five years, is it still cost efficient or is it still the way to scale up the models? Um, so far, just like practically speaking, uh, all the LMs are very data hungry, resource hungry and power hungry. Uh, and I think for OpenAI and Google and like all these leading teams training arms, they probably have already depleted all the available text that they can get in anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So the next question they're trying to answer is, should they get human experts to create a new text or find some other way? Uh, my thought is that the current, I would say it's brutal first approach seems very inefficient in the upcoming five years. Uh, and uh, there will be important progress coming in from different insights. I think first is more, uh, I, I noticed this year's ICML accepts position papers. So I think the community really need to slow down and think a bit philosophically about uh, what is the more reasonable next step. And then can we decompose tax-based operation into um, clearly defined skills. So one skill would be like directly copying from its memory and then there's a snippet which is highly uh, resemble its training data. The second one would be copy a template with placeholder for the variable names, as, as we mentioned, like placeholder for the word Mars and then change the word for that. And then like we'll get into maybe higher order. I would call direct memorization that like first order, zero order, text operation and then simple placeholder and replacement first order and then second order and so on. Like we need to define a taxonomy for text operations. And then I could also structure like what degree of the data is needed to cover all of that. Um, yeah, and then probably we also need to redefine words such as what is creativity, uh, what is novel, what is reasoning and so on. Like. Uh, the exact boundary of reasoning and memorization seems very blurry. Um, yeah, so so that's what I think would be more uh, helpful in the in the next step. And then uh, uh, maybe one last note is that there is possibility to plug in formal tools. Let's say if I um, cannot do math, we plug in some calculator and stuff. Then the next question to say to ask would be if I am plus all these plug in 
is our current status, then how far can we go? Right. So yeah. in general, I think there will be a very rich space to explore. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. So you're also saying in the past, we will live to, for, for that sort of application, we lived in a computationally constrained world, but we are gonna enter a, a data constrained world soon again, because we just run out of, of data to use. And then we have to think about these, these steps kind of whether we want to or not. And I guess all of us probably want to anyway, but uh, yeah. Right, right, yes. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Mo, I, I, I realized I misspelled your name. I'm really sorry for that. No, no, um, no worries at all. But will you still give an answer to my question? Yes, of course. Yeah, thanks Thanks very much for the summary. Um, I'm, I'm just, I just like want to follow up on, on the um, on basically what you said, I think, um, but also contextualize it in, in the kind of like domain, biology, medical science. And there, um, so there are two current approaches um, where one, people actually train these super large models and, and hope for generalization. The thing is uh, most of those models, so foundation models for biology and, and science, they're based on text-based models and image-based models. And most of the text-based models the, the bio LLMs that you see out there, um, it's kind of like modification of like open source LLMs with a lot of like false positive and a lot of like weird data that went into the training of those models. So I think the price for hallucination or like, you know, being wrong for those type of system is quite high. And um, I think the contrast is that for most of the domains that we're interested in, in cell biology and predictive tasks, we don't have much data. So we can't mine internet. So I think the the date, high data regime part is kind of like, it's, it's missing for us. And um, so I think there are two school of tasks. One is like, so people are still think there are much data. So they collect and then what would we see in biology is most of the predictions are actually on par for even for these super large models is on par with with basic but like um, task specific models. And there is a second school of thought here is the generalization will be obtained by putting a lot of inductive bias from the domain into the architecture and the mathematical design of the model, and um, what that costs. That comes at the cost of like a um, um, restrained uh, model training and also, you know, niche application of these models. And um, so I think these are the two competitive um, um, school of thousands at the moment and, 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 and applying and designing models for biology. And, um, and both sides also, you know, um, or it, um, bias toward the approaches, but it, and, but it, in my opinion, I think it should be mix of both, right? Uh, because I mean, black box and black box ML and also a, a B large scale training might not really work for to solve biology, right? And so it has to be experts who come from the biological domain, potentially, you know, learning ML and MAD and then, you know, help here to design these type of models to put these, these biases into the model, inductive biases. Mm -hmm. That was not too philosophical. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, so, so not at all. But do you expect the, do you expect the big breakthrough in your field to happen on a more kind of methodological scale? Or do you think it all comes down to being really careful about each step like for example data normalization being I careful which both. data to it's, use in the, in the first place and that do you think that's where the real value is going to be oh. yeah, it's, it's a very data limited domain right so no matter what we do we can't generate beyond certain limit of, of data in biology because it's too expensive the, the space is huge you can't mine internet so it's you're essentially you know limited to you know zero shot or a few shot setting in most in most cases, right, and and this is a fact that we have to live with. So I think it it has to come from methodological design that are inspired by you know the inductive biases that work on a very low data regime without massive pre training. 
perspective, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it's it's basically method plus a lot of domain knowledge. And that's kind of like how, for example, like AlphaFold made it, right? I think if you look at it from, it's, it's, it's beautiful from engineering side, but also a lot of like um, assumptions from biology went into designing and engineering the model that made it work, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you so much. Um, Max, maybe, maybe you're next, kind of how much is theory gonna play a role in that? Yeah. Um, that's great. And also, thank you for the really kind of poignant, a uh, very thorough and thoughtful synopsis of kind of how our different ideas intersect. Um, I think so there's my lab mate has a quote that is he's a he's a roboticist, less of a theory person. But I think it's been very instructive to me. It's if computer vision had to come up with a mathematical definition of what a cat is, we wouldn't have had any progress. Um, and I think that this idea of explicitly decomposing things into into different into different things um at least in terms of like designing algorithms or architectures is probably going to lose out in the long run uh but i think the role that theory has is it adds to us adds to our vocabulary of the different phenomena that we can talk about and reason about so for example you know from lasso regression adding to the idea and margin uh built these ideas that now we can talk about implicit regularization inductive bias we can talk about neural collapse all these things come out of like mathematical language. So it's going to be sort of an indirect effect, but I think that we need to expand the kind of phenomena that we even have in our heads floating around to reason about these things. Oftentimes, some of the language that we're using is still kind of, including my own talk, is really stuck in like 2017. And I think like Ajijing's talk was very inspiring to me because really the phenomena do change in your, if you're in like a massive multimodal large scale scenario. Um, I would say that also, and I, and I totally agree with her point that in fact, understanding distribution shift when you have sort of multiple different kinds of facets uh, coming into it, it changes things quite a bit. Uh, from what I understand, sort of the role of massive amount of data is to pre-train a model so that it's sort of always close to finding a good uh, a good logical representation, but, if, but we can't rely on pre-training alone. And what I would imagine has to be the has to be the role is actually exploration, self-play, self-active learning, data gener um, sort of data generation and, and, and sort of feedback for these models to get better and better. So I think like, again, curating tasks uh, um, knowing where, where there's ground truth, allowing these things to sort of not just learn how to predict answers, but learn how to do reasoning and sequences is going to be the next step. Um, but I also think it depends on different applications. So I think in language, it's very natural to say, what can a human do? Well, what we should do that. In biology, a human can't do very much. And so language is maybe less of a natural baseline for what for what Mo is working on. Uh, I think a lot about robotic problems, and there there are these very spatial uh, elements that I'm trying to understand very specifically, where you know your perturbation to the policy is something that that is continuous valued rather than I change or I flip a, a text uh, a piece of text. Uh, so I, I really just hope that theory kind of like expands our our range of possibilities to talk about these things, so that we can we can kind of build on that conceptual material. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Maybe. Maybe just one one last one. Um, sure. so what do you get the inspiration for your theoretical results from? For example, taking the talk now, is it really that you work on an applied kind of problem and then suddenly you notice, hey, there's, there's something interesting going on? Or, or do you start from the really kind of theoretical end and then you that's, see, that's hey, cool. that's actually kind of something I can apply in practice. That's a great question. Yeah, this one was, uh, this was, this paper in particular was just actually from reading a lot of the IRM literature and trying to under, and, and just being kind of shocked that nobody spoke about statistics. So that was more sort of a literature <laughs> intervention. Oh. But I have other yeah. works where I was working on, for example, extrapolation in robotic settings. And then I, I try to understand bilinear extrapolation and matrix completion. And a lot of my own work really just comes from like uh, annoying robot people for like four hours. And then <laughs> them not knowing what's going on and then me going to the drawing board and trying to help understand them. So most of the time it is coming from talking to practitioners, but sometimes I'll just read the literature and be annoyed that something is missing. And then I'll just write a paper uh -huh. about that too, uh, which, which uh -huh. might be totally unhelpful, but uh, you know, we have to do a bit of breadth first search uh, as well in, in this, in this time. Seems to work well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you so much again, kind of for of all the great talks. It was really great. I don't know. I don't know if you want to open kind of the, discussion or you want to close i don't know whatever i mean yeah happy to open for a bit um for like maybe another 10 minutes or something if there's more discussions 
I, I want to, by the way, thank uh, the other organizers. I, I'm happy, I happen to be speaking a lot, but there are a lot of others who helped um, or who are organizers here. So Pavel, Sinwe, Michael, like Sam, who's somewhere here, and Andre. Uh, so they all helped uh, a lot. So yeah, I want to thank them too. Yeah, Andre, you could Andre. Yeah, it's open now, so you can just talk. To hopefully open the discussion, additional discussion. Um, the question is basically stimulated by the talk of Zijing, but possibly interesting for all. Um, Zijing, you mentioned the causal architecture for related to LLMs, uh, um, related by either to do calculus or to counterfactuals. Uh, is there any way? that you maybe even see to connect these to more concrete models that we know from the causal literature, either from the graphical or from the potential outcome perspective. I mean, more concrete in terms of say, I don't know, regression discontinuity design or DAG models of concrete kind. Is there any way to connect this with the LLM architecture and the architecture that you mentioned? How to put this together and to enrich I would say the causal literature with concrete models. This sense, I hope, yeah. This was, Thank you for the question. One well, clarification. Uh, in the last several words of your question, you mentioned how to connect the causal literature with the concrete models. That concrete model means LM or? Uh, concrete model, I mean, on one side, you have the LLM architecture, which is mainly related usually to text data, and there are some models here in causal literature, but my question was uh, the um, architecture that you showed on, uh, that uh, Armin was also asking previously, for the causal counterfactuals related to the ladder and that you've shown, how to combine this, and is it possible, say, to make an um, one could say difference in difference, say model with an LLM architecture. Is Are the models compatible? Or say a DAG, a DAG, a MAG, a whatever, CP DAG, uh, connected to the LLM? Would this be feasible? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, I really appreciate it. So basically, uh, the, the formulation of your question is about we want to solve a, a causal question. And then to solve it, the CAN and LM architecture uh, incorporate basically the same operation as how the ideal human would solve it. And then here, it will probably mean that LM need to first have some, uh, I guess this was the slide. So True. I guess it will yeah. mean that in some layer of, to envision this, in some layer of LM, it should have a clear, uh, embedding of, let's say, what is embedding of vaccination? What is embedding of survival rate? Do I know that maybe the age or original physical condition, like what's the relation? And then uh, can a pair of cause and effect differ from a pair of pure correlation? Um, and then, so that's one, one thing. And then that's hopeful in that in later slides, we know that, uh, let's say, iPhone will trigger Google and Paris will trigger friends in LMs like learned weights. So the, like having a storage of causal relation as it's in its knowledge base, it's hopeful. Then we move into the second step uh, about query formalization. So this query formalization is slightly tricky in that it's, it, it probably could also be both linguistic problem and be a, a a social problem. A linguistic problem will mean that lead to means a causal relation. And then when people say lead to properly, it means as long as it's an ancestor, it's fine. It doesn't also necessarily need to be a direct cause. Uh, or if people say, if I take vaccination, then something, something, it's like extract the word if, then, then, and then like formulate it into do. Uh, however, some tricky case will be uh, let's say if I am a PhD student in X institution and I feel that co the colleagues around me are all men, there must be a gender bias. Uh, and then given that intuition, how do you formulate the gender bias in that case? And by culture or by people's experience, they think about some people might only care about the probability, conditional distribution. Given this PhD pool, I want my female colleague to be 50%. 
some of people are caring about causal effects. So then it's a cultural specific or, or user specific translation of the question to the formalization. Yeah, this is just a showcase that different steps might indicate different challenges. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Great question. Um, hi, um, maybe I have a question for Mo, which is kind of also related to one of Nikolai's questions. And I also might have missed it if you mentioned. Uh, so regarding the innovation of the methodology in your field, like in biology and maybe in particular about prediction under um, like out of distribution prediction, do you think the biggest innovation would be more coming from um, the loss function or the architecture, like from engineering side or from the data pre-processing or incorporating prior knowledge or more pieces of those? Yeah, yeah sorry, it's going to be a boring answer, but it's a, a mix of those. Um, makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's just like, a, it, it's a very complicated you don't see problem, anything. right? It's also, I think also the dialogue between the practitioners, um, I think Max discussed this, I also bugged a lot of biologists and clinicians about things. And um, so it's it's very important to have this this common language with 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 people who actually understand the system, and then you can you can talk to them and see whether you can translate them into you know equations, loss function, engineering aspect of the architecture. I think depending on like the problem, it will be either one of those, and then and then and and, and real data preprocessing also you know plays a big role. Yeah. Thanks. I actually, I have a question for Max. Given the the kind of the nice um, message about simple versus complex features, what's the? I mean, maybe again, Nikolai brought this up in some sense, but like, what's the takeaway from a from a practical point of view? So, if you were to tell like a a practitioner who's designing experiments or who kind of was setting up their uh, measurement design, what what would you kind of tell them? Um, you know, how can this be used? This this knowledge. I think there are two uh, two ways or two things. One would be uh, one we present sort of a kind of loose heuristic for guessing out of distribution performance, which is if you can use in distribution data to gauge which which area of your predictor might have like worse uh, worse generalization, foresee that this will will have further downstream effects. Uh, second thing would be in terms of data collection, right? If you can gauge sort of greater uncertainty in one, then potentially collect, collect more data to try to reduce that uncertainty. Um, but I think that I think that to me the the most interesting takeaway is is one that is maybe harder to make actionable, but still I think useful, which is that distribution shift is not only about causality; it's also about generalization. And that if a practitioner sees that there are there there are failures with distribution shift, that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to go searching for confounders. It's a good thing to do, and they should do that. But even if confounders don't arise, it, that's still okay. And, and there's there still can be other phenomena going on. So maybe it's kind of like a, a, a just kind of expanding the possibility for for troubleshooting. Mm. Uh, I think that that it's also the, the the talk I gave is also very limited to the setting of. You know, you train a classifier on one data set and you generalize to another data set. And as I mentioned in my answer, I think that formulation is slowly going away in our field. Uh, even, you know, very small regime biological data is really going to be pre trained, have some pre trained backbone. Uh, what happens in robotics is always going to have some pre trained visual backbone. Um, so it's, I really saw that result more as like a stepping stone to just get a handle on, uh, on these things. Uh, but understanding statistical effects in the massive or pre-trained data regime is, I think, kind of an open question. And it, it's maybe even a question whether statistics is even the right language mm -hmm. or if we should borrow other, borrow other ideas. For example, in a, we have this thing called the restricted isometry property for people that under, know about compressed sensing, where you basically say, I have some random measurements. Uh, I don't know exactly what they are, but sort of with good probability, the deterministic set of measurements I take is informative. 
And maybe what we'll start to understand with data quality will look something more like that, where as long it doesn't matter that I'm from a distribution or, or a distribution A or distribution B, but as long as I have examples that sort of cover the space or show me the right logical structure, a model will fit to that in the right way. And mm -hmm. I think maybe that's where we're going to have to go next. Mm -hmm. um, I see. Thank you. That's insightful. Yeah. Of course. I okay. also just ask one additional question. Hopefully others will also um, ask others. So um, your talk, I mean, uh, to me, the benefit was that the talks were, I think, quite different between each other. And my question relates, Max, you had mathematical approach and so on. And uh, the question is also broad. How to study um, maybe extrapolation or um, the phenomena you mentioned, but also general things that were mentioned like LLMs and so on. Um, data science algorithms using mathematical inequalities, probabilistic inequalities, how to study them in a mathematical sense. You showed one way, you demonstrated a novel, I would say inequality novel bound that you derived. So what is the future also in this aspect? Is that there is there are applied aspects that are being mentioned, and what is the future also here? Probably for I, all, I, Nick, Nikolai, and the uh, Max and Zijing and others. I'll, maybe, maybe I'll start. I think um, we should start doing what uh, physicists do, which is they provide simple models that are mathematically tractable and they, from which they can derive insights, and that. Hopefully, like, uh, I mean, ultimately, you want either you either want mathematics to be food for thought or you want it to be something that has predictive power uh, and can ultimately generate hypotheses, which can be tested, tested and, and falsified. And I think to go in that second, I think creative sandbox mathematics, I love it and I'm going to keep doing it, even if it's useless. But I, I do hope that what it does lead to kind of new insights. But in terms of sort of like Paparian uh, falsifiable mathematics, I think we need to generate simple models and see how they work. And I think I definitely in, in Zijing's talk, I, I see sort of inclinations towards that. A lot of the theory of learning and transformers literature, for example, will pose tractable architectures, which can be analyzed and then understand phenomena. And then via sort of attention maps kind of show that this is actually predictive. So there will have to be some empirical leap of faith by which we, we say our simplified models work, but at least our simplified models allow us to kind of generate potential hypotheses, which can then be tested. And I think maybe moving in this direction for mathematics, at least that's the direction that I've been excited about thinking about in the context of robotics in the sort of last couple of months. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I guess maybe that was such a good answer that nobody needs to <laughs> say anything more. Good. Any other questions? Good. Uh, well, maybe we call it a day. Uh, thank you so much, Max and Dijin, and I guess Mo is left, but and Nikolai, thank you so much for giving a nice discussion, open discussion. And taking the time. Thanks to you. Uh, yeah, I'll see some of Thank you guys. You and yeah, yeah, be right. aware for the next session sometime in fall. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you next session.